was by accident. Uh, at the end of 2009, I was researching a rather uh, narrow topic, and I discovered something surprising. Um, and so I began to dig deeper. And the more I dug, uh, the more I found that I considered surprising. And eventually I had uncovered so many surprising things about the underlying causes of the recession that I had, a material, I had the material for a whole book. Uh, and putting those surprising things together, what I had was a quite different account of the underlying causes of the recession than those with which you might be familiar. Uh, I mean, in the mainstream press, mainstream media, um, mainstream economists, they don't even talk about the deep underlying uh, issues. That tends to be something uh, on the left. So if you've heard about it at all, you probably heard some version of what I call the conventional uh, left account. Uh, and what I uncovered was surprising to me because it contradicts key pillars of the conventional account on the left of the economic history of the last several decades. Um, so to understand what I'm about to say did happen, um, it helps to be familiar with the conventional left account if you aren't already. Uh, so here's kind of a composite sketch of it. Um, the idea is, in the conventional left account, that the turning point of recent U.S. economic history uh, was the early 80s. You know, Reagan comes in. We've got the Volcker uh, Federal Reserve. In Britain, we've got Margaret Thatcher. We've got the rise of neoliberalism. Okay? And that is a sea change in the workings of, supposedly. And the neoliberals smashed the working class, according to the story. Uh, you know, so there's a class war, and I don't doubt that there's a class war. The question is, did the capitalists, like, emerge victorious and, you know, beat the workers into the ground? Do we, do we have a class struggle, or do we just have a class pummel, pummel, pummel? Okay, that's the issue. Well, they, they, we're told a class pummel kind of story. They pummeled the working class, workers' share of income, and the real pay declined, and, you know, when you bring down wages like that, well, it's got to be the case, right, that the rate of profit goes up. Okay, because you got wages and you got profit. You take away from wages, you got more profit. So they say that this caused the rate of profit to rebound. And with all this extra profit there, the economy could have grown very rapidly under neoliberalism in the next several decades if that profit had been plowed back into production, if it had been productively invested in factory construction in shopping, you know, uh, mall construction, in office space construction, in purchasing equipment, uh, all of that kind of stuff. If it had been productively invested, invested the economy could have grown very quickly because the profit was there. Okay, but this was neoliberalism, and it didn't happen. There was not this big productive investment boom, according to this conventional left account. But rather, the conventional left account says the profit was there, but it wasn't plowed back into production. It was diverted away from production towards financial uses, financial speculation, uh, paying dividends, um, buying back stock from shareholders, uh, all those kinds of things. So we had very low investment, and as a result of the low investment, we had uh, slow economic growth. And with slow economic growth, you get slow growth of income, so you get rising debt burdens. Right? How does that work? Well, if the dollar amount of your debt is the same, but your income is growing more slowly than you, than otherwise, than you expected, it's harder to pay off the debt. So the burden of the debt is greater the more slowly the income is growing. The less income you have, the more the debt burden is, even if the size of the debt isn't uh, bigger. Okay. So with the slow economic growth, slow growth of income, rising debt burdens, the conventional left account, which is still what I'm talking about here, uh, says that all of that set the stage for the financial crisis uh, and the Great Recession. And, you know, at the end of 2009, um, or start of 2009, when I, I just sort of stumbled on uh, something, I didn't have any real reason to doubt uh, hardly anything in, of a factual nature in this account. Uh, you know, I didn't have a position uh, or anything like that. Um, and in particular, the, the part about the decline in workers real or uh, after inflation uh, is taken away, their inflation-adjusted wages, you know, I, I, I believe that. I heard that for a very long time. Whatever I looked at uh, had confirmed that. So part of this story I believed, and part of it, um, you know, I just uh, had no position one way or the other. I didn't have any reason to, to doubt uh, much of it. Okay, but as I started to dig, 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 what I found is the following. Okay, the turning point was not the 1980s with the rise of neoliberalism. The turning point was the 1970s. Um, and instead of a 
big expansion of the economy, a new ex expansionary phase of the economy under neoliberalism, what we had was continuing relative stagnation that um, really begins in the 1970s. There are a few people who, who say this besides myself. Uh, uh, Robert Brenner, Noam Chomsky. Ernest Mandel. Ernest Mandel uh, has he, been deceased for a very long time. Uh, what I'm saying from the 70s, he compared yeah. the growth and yeah, how it yeah. was declining. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Um, I mean, you got to... That position, I think a lot of people may have had at one time, it sort of became harder to maintain that position when you start to see uh, the, the dot-com boom, you know, and then you begin to see the boom of the what, last decade. I mean, those booms kind of got people to think that this is, you know, really a new stage of capitalism called neoliberalism, you know, some sort of stable, new configuration of relations and all of this, a new expansionary phase. Um, not many people doubted that. I, I actually doubted that part, okay, but, but not, not the rest of the story. Okay, secondly, though, I found that the rate of profit never recovered from the fall of the late 1970s and early 80s. I mean, it goes up, okay, it goes back down, though, so there's no... Um, sustained recovery in the rate of profit uh, from the fall of the late 70s and early 80s, contrary to the uh, conventional left account. Okay, and I found that the rate of accumulation or rate of investment in production fell, as that story says, okay, but not because profit was diverted from investment in production towards finance. That didn't happen. That diversion did not occur uh, in the U.S., at least through 2001. And what was most surprising to me uh, is that worker share of income has not fallen, or did, uh, uh, yeah, now it has, okay, with the recession and the mass unemployment. But prior to the recession, worker share of income was stable from about 1970, you know, onward through 2007. Um, and the real compensation, the inflation adjusted compensation of workers, wages, salaries, uh, medical benefits, retirement benefits, uh, has risen um, again you know, during the period where it was supposed to have fallen from about uh, the early 70s through 2007. So basically all of those pillars of the conventional account I found um, were either very misleading or flatly wrong. Okay, so I want to go through each of those four things now in more detail. First of all, what is the turning point? Okay, I'm basically saying 1970s was the turning point. We've had relative stagnation since then. Not complete stagnation, but relative stagnation. Okay, what happens in around 1970 and in the 1970s? Okay, all of these things that we think of as maybe phenomena that begin with neoliberalism, begin with the 1980s, they actually begin earlier. The rise in income inequality seems to start uh, in 1969. Uh, public infrastructure spending growth. Um, you know, we got a huge problem of just complete crumbling of a lot of our infrastructure in this country. The fall in the growth rate starts in 1969. Um, borrowing, the debt problem. Borrowing as a percentage of gross domestic product, GDP, begins to rise right around 1970. Um, and 1971, here's an international event, and it's a very important one, is the collapse of the Bretton Woods system, the so-called international gold standard. Uh, basically, you had fixed exchange rates all throughout the world. Everything was pegged to the dollar. Uh, that collapses uh, late 60s, 1971. Uh, Nixon uh, was president, abrogated um, the conversion, the convertibility of uh, dollars for gold. He says, we're not going to give you gold if you give us our dollars back. Uh, and that leads to a rise in the price of oil in 1973, the first OPEC oil crisis, so-called. Um, and that leads then to a big sovereign debt crisis in a lot of the third world, countries that had to import oil, and uh, as a result of that debt crisis, there were a lot of defaults, um, especially by Latin American countries, uh, and restructurings of their debt. All this is the 1970s where this begins, although it doesn't break out. It's a lingering kind of crisis uh, until about the mid-80s. Uh, 1974 was the start of a fall in GDP growth throughout the world, and fall in the growth of GDP in the U.S., fall in the growth of GDP, fall in the growth of industrial production in the U.S. as well. Okay? What I'm talking about are long-term trends that continued. It wasn't just that it happened in the 1970s. Okay? There was a fall, and there was never really uh, much of a recovery in any of these things. And 1974 is when you can date the start of the uh, fall in the growth rate of workers' pay. I mean, it continues to go up. 
but there's a marked slowdown in the rate at which pay is growing. Starting in 74, uh, you get a rise in the labor force dropout rate, people just leaving the labor market. That begins in 1974 and just continues that rise in the dropout rate and the duration of unemployment. If people are unemployed, how long do they remain unemployed? That just starts to go up and up. And um, that's around 1975. All of these things, which continued under neoliberalism, can't really be said to be originally due to it, because they preceded it. Okay, so I think that there's been too much of a focus on politics, when people try to understand where we're where we're at, so to speak. I don't, my mother would scream if she heard me say at at the end of a sentence. Um, <laughs> But uh, hopefully she's not going to be watching this. Okay, well, where we are, people seem to think it's driven by politics. You know, you got the one faction of capitalism, and those were the good capitalists, and then the bad capitalists took over. But I think that really um, neoliberalism is an effect of the crisis rather than, or I shouldn't say the crisis, the, the long-term stagnation, uh, rather than the uh, cause of it. Okay. Neoliberalism is a response uh, on the part of capitalism uh, due to the failures of Keynesianism, uh, due to the stagflation, uh, the simultaneous rising rates of inflation, rising rates of unemployment in the 1970s, the inability of Keynesian policies and Keynesian administrations to be able to, um, to, to, to grapple successfully with that. That led to the, the, the success of uh, neoliberalism politically, but then neoliberalism was not able to uh, do anything more than manage, um, you know, limp along, from crisis to crisis, uh, pump up the economy so it looked like things were going well until they weren't anymore. They, they, they did that, uh, kicked the can down the road for, for decades. Okay. But they were coming into a situation that they, they didn't invent. Okay, so putting together all of what I found, here's basically how I put all the facts that I'm about to show you together. Uh, and the, really the key idea is profit matters. Well, why does profit matter? Well, investment in production matters. Okay. Investment in production matters because that's the engine of economic growth. It's the main engine of economic growth is productive investment. Okay. And uh, the economic growth is the main en engine of income growth. Okay. But you can't invest profit if you don't have the profit. Okay. So insufficient profitability is a big deal. And I think that there was insufficient profitability from a capitalist vantage point compared to how much was invested. And that's what we call the rate of profit. The profit compared to the amount of money that was invested. That's what they care about, you know, investors, capitalists. Okay, so the rate of profit falls pretty much from the mid-1950s in the U.S. Uh, never rebounds uh, in a sustained manner. That leads to a fall in the rate of accumulation or productive investment. That leads to the slowdown in economic growth. Um, and the slowdown in economic growth, as we were talking about before, leads to rising debt burdens because it's leading to a slower growth of income. But in addition, the slowdown in the economic growth and all the rest of it, the falling rate of profit, slowdown in productive investment, the government comes in. Okay? And the Federal Reserve comes in. And they come in again and again and again with policies to try to counteract and maybe reverse, or at least manage, this relative stagnation. And the kind of policies they pursue are those which you got a debt problem, and what they do is they paper over debt with more debt. So either you know they use debt to try to stimulate the economy, or they do things to encourage maybe uh, consumer debt, um, you know, home mortgage debt. Uh, you borrow, you purchase. The economy is good for a while. Okay? You kick the problem down the road. Okay, so that also led directly to rising debt burdens. Okay, and so in this way, everything then. Um, sets the stage for a series of debt crises and burst bubbles. Uh, clearly, the financial uh, crisis of the two, 2008, 2007-08 two, was not the first, okay? The uh, bust uh, bubble in the housing market was not the first. We had the dot-com bubble. There have been other bubbles uh, here in other countries. There have been a lot of debt crises. Well, I think that that's what we have when we talk about the, debt, uh, the Great Recession and the new normal, the continuing malaise since then. Uh, it's just another one of these debt crises, okay? Um, you know, and debt crises affect then jobs, they affect production and so forth, but there's a big, big overhang of debt, okay? There's a lot of unpaid debt. We've got debt levels that are way too high by various measures, and we just have that in a much bigger way than we did in any of these other previous debt crises, okay? But this is just another one of these debt crises that we've been seeing uh, for decades now. Uh, okay, 
So what I want to do here is, I'm saying that the government-fed policies to counteract all these problems uh, help to directly boost uh, the debt burdens. Uh, I talk about that in the book in a number of ways. Here's one way. Uh, the ratio of treasury debt to gross domestic product. Okay. So you know, you might hear now that the debt of the U.S. Treasury is over 100% of GDP. Okay. Uh, well, I'm only going to 2007 here, prior to the crisis, okay. and it ends the period at about 65% uh, of GDP. Okay. But right down here in 1981, it was 33% of GDP, about half. So we get this very large rise in the debt of the U.S. Treasury, what the U.S. Treasury has borrowed, just goes up and up and up. Okay. That's the actual figure. But what I said is, well, let's imagine that corporate um, income taxes paid to the government um, had not fallen as a share of GDP. They actually did. Corporate income tax as a share of GDP fell. Okay? Let's imagine that that hadn't happened. Okay? Well, the two things that caused that to fall were lowering of corporate income tax rates and a fall in the profit, the income that could be taxed as a percentage of GDP. Okay? Those are the two causes of the fall in um, corporate income tax paid as a share of GDP. If those things hadn't happened, corporate income tax rates had not been lowered, Okay? And if profit had not fallen uh, compared to GDP, which is uh, closely connected with the fall in the rate of profit, then this dotted line is what the ratio of treasury debt to GDP would have been. Okay? So it would not have b ballooned at all. Okay? The treasury debt would not have gone up as a share of GDP. It would actually have gone down from uh, 1970 to 2007. So the entire rise, the entire rise in the debt burden of the Treasury compared to GDP prior to the crisis, the entire burden is attributable to a lowering of corporate income tax rates and a fall in profit relative to GDP. Okay, so it's basically a matter of the fall in the rate of profit and government policies that help the capitalists manage that, get by by giving them back some of the profits instead of taking away in taxes. Okay, so that's an example of the kinds of things that have been done. Get different kinds of examples, but again and again, these policies are, you know, letting this one, uh, you know, survive by the government taking out debt, by the government guaranteeing debt, the government encouraging somebody else to borrow and spend again and again. Okay. So I'm talking about the fall of the rate of profit. Uh, okay, so this is profit as a percentage of the amount uh, of money invested in fixed capital or fixed assets, uh, which is equipment, uh, software, and structures, factory buildings, office buildings, uh, shopping malls, airfields, structures. So uh, here we have the two different measures of profit, a very broad measure of profit. The broadest way you can measure profit is here's the uh, output, you subtract the depreciation, and you subtract what the uh, workers are paid, okay, the compensation, you call everything else profit, okay, that's the fall in the rate of profit when you measure profit that way. Uh, if you exclude the portion of profit that goes to pay things like sales tax, if you exclude the portion of profit that goes to pay interest, you know, to banks or whatever, then you get before tax profit, okay, it's only the, the before tax profit that then uh, is subject to income tax, uh, corporate income tax, okay, and here you get the, the trajectory of the uh, before tax rate of profit. So very clearly, both of them fall from uh, pretty much the start of the post-war period, uh, maybe a little bit later. Uh, they fall, uh, this one kind of falls until uh, 1982, and then it's basically flat since then. Uh, this one, it just keeps falling. Okay, so it, you know, I, when I say never recovers, Obviously, there are short-term recoveries, but there's no sustained recovery in either one. Okay, this levels off. This continues to trend downward. Okay, now some people criticize the way that profit, uh, the rate of profit is measured here because they say that the way the rate of profit is measured here uh, is affected by inflation. And that's true. You can see this, the 1970s were not a good period, um, but the rate of profit goes up because of prices going up. You know, prices go up, the companies make more money, right? Uh, they also have to spend more money to buy supplies and, and, and so forth, but they're, they're, making, they're making more money. So the rate of profit goes up, and that's just due to inflation. So some people don't like measuring um, the rate of profit that way because they say it's affected by inflation, and that's true. 
but I did an inflation correction. Okay, so the black curve here in this graph is the top one in the um, graph here. So I took the, the top number, top set of numbers here, uh, and I adjusted for inflation, and I get the red set of numbers here. Okay, so there's a little bit less of a downward trend in the rate of profit, but you still have a downward trend in the rate of profit. So the inflation adjustment doesn't have that much to do uh, with anything. We can still definitely say that this rate of profit, even adjusted for inflation, definitely never recovers uh, during the neoliberal period, and it continues to go down, down, down on average. Okay, now all of those rates of profit that I just showed you, those are for domestic corporations. That's the one case here where I said, uh, here's something that is not affected uh, in a certain way by uh, events outside the U.S. Okay, that's just profits uh, obtained through U.S. operations. Uh, but you got U.S. multinationals. The parent company is a U.S. company. Uh, it invests abroad. It's got subsidiaries uh, abroad. And, you know, there's been a tremendous growth in the profits that have been obtained by U.S. multinational corporations from their foreign subsidiaries. But the rate of profit, the profit that they're getting from that, compared to the amount of money they had to invest to get that profit, that rate of profit has gone down. Okay? So that's the rate of profit of uh, U.S. multinationals from, the, um, from their foreign subsidiaries. So it's the income from direct foreign investment as a percentage of the accumulated uh, foreign direct investment. And very much just trends downward. Um, so it's very similar, in fact, to uh, the trajectory of that other rate of profit here, the, the top one. Okay. But it's, very, it's measured very differently because it's a very narrow measure of profits and after-tax rate of profits. It's the only one for which there are data. It actually, it's the only one for which it makes sense. Okay. So if you just look at the domestic corporations operating in the U.S., that rate of profit goes down. You look at the profitability of U.S. multinationals abroad, that rate of profit goes down. So, you know, the whole thing goes down however you, you, you want to look at it. Okay, so that's then two pillars of the conventional left account. The starting point supposedly was the 1980s and neoliberalism, and supposedly the rate of profit rose. Well, no. Um, the third pillar, I think this is really most important, the most important one for understanding the link between profitability and the rest of the economy is again that movements in the rate of profit can drive movements in investment or accumulation, productive investment, because what is being invested is profit. And if you don't have profit, you can't invest the profit. Okay. Uh, now, this graph is actually not in the book, but it's on, it's on my website. Um, the red is a different rate of profit. This is the after-tax rate of profit domestically. Okay. The reason I wanted to look at this is because, really, it's the after-tax profit that's available for investment, not the before-tax profit and not the part of profit that goes to pay interest or the part that goes to pay sales taxes. So what's left over is the after-tax profit. Uh, and so that's the after-tax rate of profit, the red, and the blue is the rate of accumulation, uh, productive investment uh, as a share of um, the existing uh, accumulated investment. And what you see is these are percentage changes from the year uh, 1948. Okay, so they both start, in the, well, 1947 is here, but 1948 values are 0%. Okay. And there's stuff that happens all the way along, but by the end of the period 2007, the rate of profit and the rate of accumulation have fallen almost by the same exact percentage, 41, 43%. Okay. Uh, moreover, look at what moves first and what moves second here. In almost every case, you first get a movement in the rate of profit, then you get a response in the rate of accumulation. And that's very important for telling us what causes what. Okay. So I, I look at this and I say, don't look at that blip in the middle. Forget that for a moment, but just look at the ups and downs in general. You see that, let's say, <coughs> right here, first you get the fall in the rate of profit, then you get the fall you know, in the rate of accumulation. So it's clear that the profitability um, of investment in the past is driving, uh, in this period in the U.S. at least, for U.S. corporations, the profitability of, of uh, these companies is driving their, their uh, subsequent investment in production. This is investment in production. Okay. Now, they're going to, if, if nothing else affected 
the rate of accumulation besides the rate of profit, they would fall by exactly equal percentages. Okay, so the fact that they wind up at both 41, 43% down, which is big, uh, and it's almost the same amount, that seems to indicate that a lot of stuff happened over the period, but when all was said and done over the 60 year period, the only long run driving force, when all was said and done, of the decline in productive investment was due to the decline in the rate of profit. Okay, but I do want to focus on this point where the rate of accumulation of the blue goes up and then plummets. Um, because the story that uh, profit has been diverted from production to finance under neoliberalism um, relies on starting at the peak and then looking at the decline in the rate of accumulation that doesn't have anything to do or very little to do with the fall in the rate of profit there. Okay, But neither does that sharp rise here. So something else was going on here to distort that long-run relationship. Okay, Here's another way of looking at it. This is a graph from the book. The percentage of after-tax profit that was reinvested in production. Okay, So you got some profit. How much do they plow back into production? Okay, that's, what, uh, that's the other thing that can affect the rate of accumulation. Okay, So you had a pretty stable percentage from the beginning of the post-war period through about 1972. And then, you know, after 72 or 73, things go haywire. This is the period where everything's starting to go haywire. And so in 1974, and then several years in the late 70s and early 80s, you have the percentage of after-tax profit that's reinvested is above or very close to 100%. When it's above 100%, it means they're investing in production more profit than the profit that they have. Okay? You can't do that forever. It's not a sustainable situation. Okay? You can do it temporarily. You, you know, more borrowing, whatever it is. Okay? But it's not sustainable. So what happens here is the rate of profit comes down. And at first, the rate of accumulation does not respond. I mean, look right here. The rate of accumulation is very high. The rate of profit falls sharply here. Okay? There's a lagged effect. Okay? So because there's very little profit and they're still carrying out investment plans that they made two years ago, uh, you know, let's build this you know, shopping mall, whatever it might be. Okay? So they're, they're still investing like things are good. The profitability has come down. And so you get more than 100% uh, of profit being reinvested in uh, production for a while. But then it falls. It has to fall. It's not a sustainable level. Okay, so first of all, that fall doesn't have anything to do with neoliberalism. That fall in the percentage of profit invested, that's just a correction of an excess. That's just bringing the thing back to sustainable levels. Because second of all, through 2001, the level to which this comes down is not subnormal. This is not something peculiar to the neoliberal period. Look at the rates of accumulation here. Or the, excuse me, the percentages of profit reinvested here, they're not lower than prior to neoliberalism. Okay? And if they're not pro lower than prior to neoliberalism, how is neoliberalism a new stage of capitalism that doesn't you know, invest in production and just plays the stock market and buys back stocks and all of these things that, that we're, we're told? Uh, it just doesn't wash. Now, there is an issue after 2001, um, and... Um, you know, I've, I've dealt with that elsewhere. Brief, say the following. Um, almost all of the fall in the rate of accumulation occurs on or before 2001. Okay, so if you want to talk about why the, why the rate of accumulation falls, what's happening after, uh, okay, this is 2002, so that's 2001. Almost all of the fall <coughs> is by 2001. So the events from 2002 onward, uh, I don't think it goes along with the story about you know, neoliberalism and uh, just financial speculation instead of investment in production. Uh, but even if it did, uh, what's actually accounting for the fall in the rate of accumulation uh, happens really through 2001, not, not thereafter. So what's happening a little later really is maybe interesting, but not crucial for understanding the long-term decline in the rate of accumulation. That is driven by the fall in the rate of profit, uh, at least in the U.S. case. Okay, so here you get... Uh, Percentages of profit that is reinvested. This is the issue. Did they divert profit from production under neoliberalism? Okay, so the light gray is pre-neoliberal. Uh, 
percentages of profit reinvested, four different measures of the rate, four different measures of um, profit. Okay, the dark gray is the first 21 years of neoliberalism, and for four different measures of profit, during the first 21 years of neoliberalism, a greater percentage of profits being reinvested. Then you get this weird stuff, 2002 to 2007. Uh, let me skip that. Um, let me skip that for the moment. Uh, let me come to this. I want to talk about the, the remaining pillar of the conventional left account, which is really what the whole thing depends on. The neoliberals come in, they smash the workers, um, that's what makes the rate of profit go up, supposedly. We've seen it hasn't, but that they say it goes up. Um, they smash the workers according to the conventional left account. Uh, workers' real wages uh, decline, you know, what they make it after inflation, uh, and their share of income goes down. That's the conventional uh, left account. Um, well, I wouldn't say that this is 100% incorrect, technically, but it's extremely misleading. Um, and... I'm not the only person on the left who thinks it's misleading. Uh, I want to read you something that was um, that I just read recently by J uh, James Kenneth Galbraith. You may be familiar with his father if you're not familiar with him, the late John Kenneth Galbraith. Uh, he runs uh, the University of Texas Inequality Project. He came out with a couple books on inequality, one uh, last year. And the winter 2013 issue of The Stradler uh, has a, an interview uh, with Jamie Galbraith. And Galbraith says, I think there's a tendency on the left to focus on some statistical aspects of what's happened to wages, median wages in particular, and to focus less on the role played by Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, housing programs, public education, and support for higher education. The typical story is that median wages peaked in 1972 and have been stagnant and falling since then. As a result, it must be the case that people who are working now are much worse off than they were 10, 15, 20 years ago. That's not an accurate story, at least not up until the crisis in 2008, because, this is very interesting what he says, because over that period, the labor force became younger, more female, more minority, and more immigrant. All these groups start at relatively low wages, and they all then tend to have upward trajectories. Okay. Like the wages of, of women go up, wages of immigrants go up. So there's no reason to believe that life was getting worse for members of the workforce in general. On the contrary, for most members of the workforce, it was still getting better. So he says, the real threat to the middle class is not there. It's in the erosion of the programs I just mentioned. Uh -huh. the Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, and, and all that. That is to say, it's in the attack on the public schools, in the squeeze on higher education, threat to Social Security. When you look at housing, you have a very large, unambiguous loss. Millions of people have been displaced, but many, many more have lost the capital value of their homes. They won't be able to sell and retire on the proceeds. So he's talking about the threat right now as a result of the crisis and the, the recession and the continuing malaise, okay? But this is not causes uh, of, of the um, situation that led, it, it, these are not conditions prior to, to the, uh, the recession and the crisis, okay? So he, he's making that distinction, okay? So he's saying the threat isn't, you know, this supposed long-term decline in wages, the threat is what's happening now, measures to try to get out of the recession. So he then says, the abstract statistical picture of wages doesn't connect to people's experience. Okay, and that's very interesting, because a lot of people on the left seem to think that it does. Um, but, I mean, obviously people have different experiences, and different people experience the same thing different ways, okay? So you can't make a blanket statement. I mean, he's making a generalization. So, but he says, if I were designing the boilerplate rhetoric of a popular movement, I would take a blue pencil to these statistical formulations about wages. I don't like the stagnant median wage argument. I think it obscures what actually happened. And I don't particularly care for the 1% argument. I understand it has a certain power, but one can be much more precise about what it is you want to attack and what it is you want to preserve uh, and to build. Um, and I mean, he's not the only person on the left that's saying this. There's Steve, Steve Rose, there's myself. Um, so I don't think it's really a left-right issue. I think it's really a correct versus incorrect issue, I mean, frankly. Um, so let me show you some of what I discovered, uh, and this really floored me. I mean, I didn't know any of this stuff uh, a few years ago. Um, in, when was this, 2008? 2008. John Bellamy Foster and Fred Magdoff published an article in Monthly Review which showed that wages and salaries fell from... Um,
53. Hmm. 53% of GDP. Uh, okay, I, I don't have their figure there. Okay, they showed the wages and salaries fell from 53% of GDP in 1970 to about 46% in 2007. Okay, this is similar to what they showed, but this is not as a percentage of GDP, this is a percentage of net national product, because it's wrong to divide by gross domestic product for reasons that I can explain to you if you care to, to know that. But if you just look at wages and salaries as a share of the output of the country, you do get this really marked downward trend. Okay. And that's what people are, are tending to focus on on the left. That's what Galbraith is reacting against as well. Um, what I discovered, you know, I heard the wages have gone down. I thought that people weren't using wages and salaries in such a technical way. Okay. But I thought they were including the other components of our compensation as, as workers. Um, employer provided uh, private retirement and be medical benefits. I get medical benefits, you know, uh, medical insurance partly paid for by my employer. I get retirement uh, benefits paid for my, by my employer. Okay, a lot of uh, the workforce does. You add those in, you get much less of a decline. Okay, and then there are government and employer contributions to a worker's so-called social insurance benefits. Okay, in the US, as you know, every employer kicks in an equal amount with the employee for social security and for Medicare. Okay, so that's part of your overall compensation or what you're getting from the employer is the part of the Social Security and Medicare taxes that you don't have to pay that they pay for you. Okay, so you add those in and then you add in the government. Um, why, would that, why would that be going up if wages are going down? Why would the government... I'll, I'll, I can talk about that in the discussion. Okay, I can talk about that in the discussion, but yeah, we got... Uh, I mean, basically, there's a shift in the demographic demographics of the country and, and the aging and, and so forth. Okay, we've got uh, the government contributions for worker social insurance. I mean, in other words, other social security spending by the government uh, above and beyond what wor uh, workers and employers contribute, uh, Medicare, unemployment insurance, railroad retirement, disability uh, uh, insurance, other minor items. Okay. You add all of that, okay, which is really just still workers pay, uh, somewhat deferred, you get almost no decline whatsoever. And if you want to talk about the entirety of the working class, not just employees, okay, you have to talk about the lowest rung of the working class, people who have very intermittent work or no work, you know, chronically. Um, so you've got to talk about public assistance, other government provided cash benefits, public assistance, other disability benefits, the earned income tax credit, cash payments, child tax credit cash payments, veterans benefits, employment and training benefits, education benefits, and some other minor items. Okay. You throw in all of these things, in addition, not only do you not get a decline, you get a slight rise. Okay. Even before the crisis. I mean, the thing goes way up in the last several years. Big rise in unemployment insurance benefits, for, for instance. Okay. But this goes to the issue of the underconsumptionist argument that we have a crisis because working people's incomes have been falling as a share of the product. And they can't buy back mm -hmm. as big a share of the product. So we have a crisis in the making. But what comes along is a lot of consumer debt. So they borrow, borrow, borrow to keep up their standards of living, to keep up the share of the product that they can buy, okay, by going deeper and deeper into debt, and so we get a big debt crisis that way. That's the under-consumptionist argument, is that the debt crisis is due to people borrowing to keep up their standard of living, at least in part it's due to that, but they were borrowing to keep up their standard of living, and without that borrowing, their ability to buy the share of the output was going down, 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 down. But it didn't happen. Okay, their ability to buy a share of the output doesn't depend only on wages and salaries in the narrow sense. Okay, you're buying output, you're buying medical services with your medical benefits. You get retirement benefits, you, you're able to purchase goods and services when you retire. Okay, but more of that factored in here as well. And then people on public assistance, they spend that money. Okay, people on unemployment insurance, they spend that money. People get uh, earned income tax credit uh, money, working people, they spend that money on goods and services. So what the red line is measuring is the ability of the working class to buy the product Without going deeper into debt. Can I ask a question? Uh, no. Just a clarifying question about you. Okay. Yeah. Are those 
Are those median values or those aggregate values? Is that like the aggregate of all? That takes the total amount of those incomes and divides by the national product. Okay, this is not on a per so person. So that, this is not a per pay. person basis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm just adding to the wages and salaries and this and this and this. Okay, so you add in all of this, and it's about 69% uh, of the net national product prior to uh, the recession. Okay, so the, if the question is, is the working class able to buy only a smaller share of output without going deeper into debt, the answer is unambiguously no prior to the recession. Okay, if we're focusing on, on that. Okay, I want to look at a couple of other issues connected uh, with this. Um, in the corporate sector, Okay, this is the net value added, the output of corporations. From 1970 to 2007, the red is the share that is received by employees as compensation. Not just wages and salaries, but retirement benefits and medical benefits. Both private retirement and medical benefits and the uh, portion of Social Security and Medicare taxes paid by uh, employers. Okay, basically that's trendless. It's not falling at all. And the remaining <coughs> share, which is profit in the broadest sense, trendless. <laughs> okay, and this is well, this is trendless, even though uh, the, the compensation share goes pretty down, down pretty uh, sharply for several years in uh, the last decade during that phony boom. Um, okay, so I, I do I, I do want to emphasize that compensation of employees has not been growing as fast as it did. There has been relative stagnation uh, since the early '70s. But here you see, um, if we just look at um, the growth displayed by the GDP price index and uh, adjusting for inflation this way. Here's the net value added of the corporations, the dark one. Here's the compensation. The compensation, excuse me, the net value added growth falls very sharply. The compensation growth falls very sharply. Uh, you deflate some other way. You get the, the same thing. You just get uh, somewhat different amounts of decline. Okay. But the point is the compensation growth is falling rather sharply. But it's falling rather sharply because the total output growth is falling rather sharply. So it, working people haven't been getting such a great boost of income as they did in the early post. That's for sure. But it's not a distributional issue. It's not because the capitalists are doing better. No, the capitalists aren't doing any better either. Okay? So there's this generalized economic crisis and... Excuse me, it's not a crisis. Now we're in crisis. This generalized relative stagnation of the economy since about the early 70s, and the, the, the capitalism is not doing well, and workers' share in the United States is not falling, but it's uh, falling, it's a, it's a constant share of something that's not rising at the rate it used to be rising. Any, uh, it's not doing that anymore. Okay. So... Uh, Sometimes people look at the, the compensation figures and they say, ah, yeah, but you know what, this is all CEOs and this is all, you know, upper management and that's not really wages, you know, these aren't really workers, that's really surplus value. Uh, and I've looked, looked, looked at this, uh, Magdoff and Foster just came out with an article that tries to show that. I'm in the middle of writing a response. They really mangled the data, uh, unbelievably. Okay, what, I, I don't think that there's much to that. Okay, basically, if you look at upper management, CEOs, uh, other top management, there are too few of them to have a major impact on the aggregate data. Okay, they, they can have exorbitant pay, exorbitant growth in pay, but you know, how many hundred top CEOs are there? Who's buried in Grant's tomb? How many hundred top CEOs are there? hundred. hundred, right? Okay, it's a hundred people, for God's sakes, right? Uh, it's not going to have that, that much of an impact. What has happened a lot, and what may color certain people's perceptions of what happened a lot is that, you know, if you have a certain picture of what the working class is, male, high school educated, blue collar, those people took a big hit. Well, you can see that from these data come from a, a Congressional Budget Office study. Okay, if you look at the men in pink, um, right, so those who have only uh, less than a high school degree or high school degree, their pay adjusted for inflation has fallen significantly since 1979. Okay, even those with some college but not a four-year college degree, if they're men. Okay, and then four-year college grads receiving the big uh, boost, uh, and those who have uh, some graduate education even more. Okay, but also this whole idea of a class struggle driving down wages and this 
you know, the, 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 the changing portions of pay being due to some pummeling of the capitalist class against the workers, it doesn't cut it. Because look at the rise in women's wages. How come women are exempt from being pummeled in this class war against the working class? Because they're out ship, shipping jobs over, factory jobs overseas. For Thank you. Thing, right? Because the fact... Well, wait a minute. If there's a class war against the working class, why are the capitalists not going after the women's wages? Why are the capitalists letting even women who don't even have 12 years of school, their they're, they're wages... This is just wages, by the way. This does not account for any of that other compensation, retirement and, and medical benefits. It's been going up by gangbusters. This is part of what Galbraith is talking about. Okay, So there is a tremendous increase in the differentiation of the working class, the working population. Some people haven't done very well. Some have been doing a lot better, Okay, as, as Galbraith uh, points out. You know, women, immigrants, uh, minorities, young people. Um, well, he's talking about as they get older. I mean, basically... Um, well, I could get into a lot of things. But the idea of it just being managers versus the whole undifferentiated working class doesn't cut it. Okay? A tremendous amount of the growth of inequality in pay is within the working class. I mean, look at this. Four-year college graduates. These are not all CEOs in upper management. And look at it. You get a 40% rise in the pay of women in that category. Okay? And you get a 20% rise in the pay of men in that category. So it, it, the, the, the whole idea of the working class having been smashed by, by the neoliberals, just, there's really nothing to that. Okay, so let me just uh, finish up. I think that the implication of what I'm saying about distribution is that share the wealth struggles face strict limits because the wealth has not been there to share. There has been relative decline in profitability that never... Um, it never corrected itself in the long run. There was never a sustained recovery in the rate of profit. Okay? So the wealth has not been there to share in a very real sense. So this idea that you're going to, first of all, solve the problems by redistributing income, first of all, it's not an income redistribution. It's not, the crisis is not caused by maldistribution of income. It, 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 that didn't happen. The working class's ability to buy the product did not fall. And the reason it didn't fall was not because they went deeper into debt. That's the first thing. Second of all, um, you're just not going to be able to solve these problems by taking away from the rich and giving to the poor. Why not? Well, I, let me say, I do think that struggles to protect and enhance people's standard of living can succeed. I'm all in favor of them. I support them. That's not the issue whether I'm in favor of them or not. The question is, are these solutions to the capitalist crisis the continuing economic malaise. Will this redistribution put capitalism as a system on a sounder footing? Okay? It's not a question of what, what I want. It's a question of how will this affect the capitalist system? Is this a solution that will lead to a stable capitalism instead of what we have right now? That's the issue, and I don't think so for a very simple reason. Okay? You, you give the people, you take away from profit to do that, you're lowering profitability even more, and the root of what we have been going through for decades is low profitability. As a result of that, low investment, uh, sluggish economic growth, sluggish income growth, all tied up with this lack of profitability. Okay? Those problems are being caused by sluggish profitability. You lower profitability even further, you're not going to get a booming capitalist system. You're going to have even a less stable system, one that's more prone to severe crises and recessions than you know, what we've seen before. Okay? So I'm not saying you can't struggle to keep homes, keep jobs, even get all kinds of increases. Yeah, it happened in the, the Great Depression. The working class won gains in the midst of a tremendously bad depression. It can happen. We should fight for that. But it's not a solution to capitalism's problems. And it wasn't in the 30s either.